Sure. So what inspired me was many years ago, what I realized is people were asking me, why was I creating a new company to do interactive marketing and not doing it inside Leo Burnett, the advertising agency? That it was going to be owned by Leo Burnett. I would remain a Leo Burnett employee, but I was going to create a completely new company. Why did I want to create a new company? Why couldn't I do it inside the current company? And that's when I came up with the future does not fit in the containers of the past. Okay. I'm not calling Leo Burnett the past. I mean, from then it's still around. But basically there were three big challenges that I began to understand. I tried to first do it inside, right? But then I realized I couldn't do it inside. And that's why I said I had to do it outside. And what were the reasons? The first reason is usually when something new happens, it has a form of technology or change that threatens the old business. Okay. So think about the fact that when streaming happened, it threatened blockbuster stores. Okay. And for a long time, blockbuster, eventually they got into the streaming business. They almost went and bought Netflix, right? But to a great extent, blockbuster was threatened first by CDs through mail, but their entire way you made money was this way. And this would change it. Think about Gillette. Gillette charged a lot for their blades and had television networks and selling through Walmart and Dollar Shave Club said, I'm going to go direct, not sell through Walmart, use YouTube and sell blades to subscription that are cheaper. Why wouldn't Gillette do that? Because it would hurt Gillette's margins. Mm. It would hurt their relationship with Walmart. They didn't know how to do the subscription business. They didn't have the same efficiencies with sampling as they did with television networks. So every time a new idea comes, if the idea is really new, it actually threatens the old company. Yeah. Right. It threatens the old way of working. It threatens the old talent. I was in a company where all the creative talent made film and went to LH to shoot film. But digital, I needed people who wrote code and sat on their computers and created work and then go to LA and not didn't do film. The person who was doing film brilliant as they were, I didn't know how to write code. Right. How would I attract people who wrote code? I couldn't say, by the way, you report to people who make film. They say, why would I do that? That's, and then the way you charge for digital was very different than you charge for television. So I had to have a different business model and economic model in a different company. Otherwise my client would basically say it's part of Leo Burnett. It's part of the services. You should offer it for the same cost. So for those reasons, I began to realize that the future does not fit in the containers of the past or the mindsets of the past. And what we often do is we try to put the future into the way we've designed for today. And every company is designed to succeed for today. They aren't designed to succeed for tomorrow, right? Then they create models so that they can also remain relevant tomorrow. But one of the reasons so many individuals and companies fail when there are transitions is because they are not ready for the transition. And when you are ready for the transition, it means you have to sometimes destroy what got you to the party. See what most people don't realize the product that saved Apple, right? Was not the iPhone. The product that saved Apple and made them very profitable initially was the iPod. Okay. And the fact that they had the Apple store, the iTunes store and the iPod. Yeah. When the Apple phone came out, it had an iPod inside it. You didn't need to buy an iPod. Go and try to buy an iPod today at the Apple store. Okay. So they destroyed the business that they had built that had saved them and created this new business. Hmm. Right. That was interesting. Similarly, Netflix destroyed the business that they had, which was CD through mail to build a streaming business. Some companies make that transition, but if you notice, it's completely different businesses. <laughs> yeah. And that is why, and then the future doesn't fit in the, in the past. Then is the sub stack, which I write. And then I have this page where, I, which you've seen, which I've organized all the best articles speaks to all the challenges that people have. How do they think about the future? How do they manage change? How do they themselves grow as skills and leaders? 
Mm. What's the future of marketing, right? Those are the things that eventually you need in order to succeed in the future. Mm. Yeah. So that's what I was coming uh, to next. That uh, you have written about four shifts. So yes. Tell us a little, a brief about these four shifts. That how sure. So actually, the four shifts, interestingly, uh, since you have a global and other audience, happened during. December and early January, so December of 2022 and early January, which was the first time I returned to Asia and a little bit of Europe, Europe and Asia after three years, right? So because of COVID, I had not traveled, and the only two international trips I took prior to that was I went to Australia and I went to Iceland, so two big islands. Okay, I then went. To Italy and India and the Middle East for like a ten, twelve day period, and that's when I wrote the four shifts because in the back of my mind I realized that something big was happening. And so, what are the four shifts? The four shifts are technology shifts, power shifts, boundary shifts, and mind shifts. And I'll explain to you what those are. And they have shifted so much that I. Spend a lot of time with very senior people and less senior people in companies, saying, "Do you know this is happening? And mm-hmm. if this is happening, don't you think you should shift the way you think about how you do things? Because there are these shifts going around you, right? Yeah. So what are they? So let me start with something which is very simply a power shift. So power is moving in two ways. It's moving from the Western world to The southern and eastern world. Mm. Primarily, it is moving in big ways right now to Asia. So when I was in India, which has already become the fourth world's fourth largest economy in the world, and it's going to become the world's largest population this year, and likely the third largest economy soon after China and the United States, most people there want to be thirty years old yeah. because they think. The future is ahead of them. In Europe and the United States, most people don't want to be young because they think the best days are behind them. Okay, most people in Asia believe that their system will get them to the future. Most people who are millennials and Gen Z in the United States believe the system is stacked against them. Right. So one is there's this power shift going from. The West to the East. The other power shift is from the company to the individual, because of technology, because of marketplaces like Shopify, because of technology like, say, Substack. Right? Each of us now have world-class technology available to us for free. Soon we will have the best of ChatGPT and AI for twenty dollars a month if we want, or even free on Bing. That basically gives me. All the stuff that big companies had, I now have. I have marketplaces. I have technology. I have, you know, ability to reach people, right? As I tell you, I sit at home and I reach people with Substack and my podcast by myself. Yeah, <laughs> I couldn't do that ten, fifteen years ago. Yeah, right. So when some big person says I control access to my client, I said I'm already talking to your client. What are you talking about? Okay, so that's a power shift. Right to the east and to the individual, and to the smaller, not in the smaller. So, for instance, all the net new jobs in America in the last four years have been created in companies less than 250 people. All the net new jobs. That doesn't mean big companies haven't created new jobs, but they've also lost new jobs. But the net new are among the small companies. So that's one. Second is their technology shifts. We had the first connected age when the internet came around, and we connected to share and transact. We call that e-commerce and search. Then we had the second connected age, which built on the first, where we were connected to everybody, connected all the time, and connected to distraction. We call that mobile and streaming and social. And now we've entered the third connected age, which builds on those, of which one is data connecting to data, or machine learning, or AI, which is what we're hearing about, like ChatGPT. 5G is going to change things. Blockchain is going to change things, and then AR, VR, and voice is going to change things, right? So that's the second shift: is technology shifting, which you're already seeing in the Microsoft Google wars. You know, Apple doing things that hurt Facebook. All of that's shifting. The third is 
what I, you know, basically do believe is another sort of major shift, which is the boundary shift, which is the boundaries between what was offline media and online media, the boundaries between countries, right? They're all dissolving. So a lot of people say, you know, there's a firewall in China. There is a firewall in China. But how about if I tell you this? that 40% of all the merchants who sell on Amazon in the United States are based in China. Okay. That the number one people who are on LinkedIn are in Asia, entire North America. Right. So this whole idea of like boundaries, mm. whether it's the journey countries, it's all changing. And then the last one is a mind shift. And the mind shift is the one that many senior people are having the biggest problem with, which is the generations are very different. And for the first time, we have four generations at work and the young generations don't believe in the same thing as the older generations. And it's very dramatic, right? And it's not like they're going to grow up. They've just grown up completely differently. Young people have college debt. The old people didn't have college debt, right? Old people believe in capitalism. 62% of the young people don't believe in capitalism. The old people like to have one company, one job. The young people basically say, I don't want to be controlled by a company. I want to have side hustles and side gigs. Okay. So that happens to be like one shift. The other shift is because of COVID, all of us, our minds are like champagne corks. When you come out of the champagne bottle, you can't put it back. The cork swells. Our minds have swelled. We have understood about new possibilities and flexibility and new ways of doing things. And you can't take us back again, right? And so to a great extent, I'm not saying that in-person interaction and events aren't important, they are, but the office is going to be less and less important, right? And forcing people five days a week into the office is dooming companies, dooming companies, right? Because they are going to be less flexible, less agile, less talented, right? You can do that without doing that. So you take the power shift, the boundary shift, the mind shift and the technology shift. And then you come up and you say, I'm going to market the same way. Come on. <laughs> you can't. <laughs> right. Great. And so that's the key. And what I've done, as you probably have seen, is I can take a lot of these complicated things and make it easy and make it urgent, which then makes senior and middle market people, not just marketing, I work across all the brands, say, oh, we have to change. And then I show them how to change. Because I just don't like say, Okay, you have to change. What do you do? So I say, yes, how you can think about it. I can't say specifically what you do as a company because I don't know the company, yeah. but I basically set up frameworks on how to think about it, how to do any particular thing you want to do.